So, Star Wars Tales of the Empire is out. And we are going to talk about both everything that I liked and everything that I disliked. And I feel as though the like stuff is just going to be mostly nostalgia and funny things that I noticed. And then the dislike is going to be an overall critique about uh, the, the show in its entirety over all six episodes. Um, things that I enjoyed. I actually liked seeing Morgan Elsbeth's past. And the reason as to why is because there's a there's a there's a slice of canon that we haven't seen animated, which is the eradication of the the sisters of Dathomir. There's a whole situation that happens before this in the comic books, uh, in regards to how Darth Maul escaped how his escape was essentially planned by Palpatine, because Palpatine knew that the sisters of Dathomir were on Dathomir. He just did not know where on Dathomir, and he released Maul to basically lead him to Mother Talzin so that he can kill Mother Talzin. Those events happened first. What we pick up with is the fallout. Mother Talzin is dead. Most of the core Night Sisters are dead. They've been decimated by uh, Dooku and Palpatine, and Grievous, and Grievous is just basically on mop-up duty. And let me say this now, as somebody who enjoys the Clone Wars animated series from, I think it was like 2003, it is great seeing Grievous in his prime. When Grievous is doing just Grievous things, it is absolutely fantastic. When he's just enjoying that thrill of the hunt, finding somebody new to take on, and he is just eliminating them in brutal fashion, that is fucking great. There is, there, oh my God, there's just, whew, there's something to enjoy. Because I remember from the 2003 series, Grievous was my favorite character. And in the 2003 series, the reason why he coughed is because Mace Windu hit him with a force crush uh, as he was leaving. And we're basically seeing the after effects of his lungs being damaged from that. I know that in the Clone Wars series, they changed it to something else. I don't remember it off the top of my head, but it was no longer off of that force crush. Like, Mace was off of blood when he hit him with that Force Crush. But seeing that entire situation, seeing that there are more tribes of, of people on Dathomir that branched off from the Night Sisters, and there's like a mountain tribe and a bunch of other tribes doing their own thing, living in their own peace, it's actually good to know that the, 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 the Night Sisters weren't the only people on Dathomir. There are a bunch of other clans that continue to exist, and those clans have their own unique way of using the Force. Uh, that was cool to essentially see. Um, moving on, I, I didn't really care for the second episode with Morgan Elizabeth again. Um, I really feel as though I, I did the same thing I always do when I see... Uh, Pelion, which is I see Pelion and instantaneously I start looking around to see where exactly uh, Thrawn is because he's somewhere. He's, he's, if he's not in the room, he's outside the room looking in or he's standing outside the room listening to what's going on inside as Pelion is just in there as as his eyes and ears. Uh, it was It's always fantastic to see Thrawn. He looked absolutely fantastic uh, uh, um, in his, in his pre-Grand Admiral fit. Great. It's always fantastic seeing him. I love the conversation that he had with Morgan Elsbeth, where, and I've said this before, Thrawn acts like a, a, a shonen detective, where he basically shows up and he's like, Morgan Elsbeth, sister from Dathomir, a lost child after the Clone Wars when her world was burned down. And you're like, how do you have this information? Because it doesn't seem as though the galactic... Republic or or even the the Galactic Empire would have had data sheets of okay you were born on Dathomir you know here's your stamp for the day in which you were born Morgan Elizabeth here's your I here's your Galactic Imperial ID with where you're essentially from and it's like Thrawn just he just collects just nonsensical information like a shonen detective where he's like you know ah yes Morgan Elizabeth 
Three years ago, you walked into a cantina at 104 degrees, and you exited the cantina with a slightly elevated body temperature of 106 degrees. This is an ability only known to that of the sisters of Dathomir. That is how I was able to find you and your location. He be on some shit. But it, like I said, it's, it's always great to see Thrawn. Uh, episode three, I think we had jumped back to Barris. What's episode three, Barris? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, because your boy still has, your boy still has episode three up. So let me jump into this right quick, and let me go ahead and mute that. And let me see something. Was episode three, Barris? No, episode three was a continuation of Morgan Elsbeth. Didn't care again. Um, I really feel as though this episode wasn't needed, or this episode was essentially wasted. Uh, which is going to be an overall critique that I get to once I go through all of the the reviews per episode, getting towards the end. But this was my least favorite episode. I didn't really care for the episode. I feel as though the New Republic walked in with like that, ooh, look at me, I've got some shiny shit on with my, you know, with my fresh blue fit uh, as a representative of the New Republic, blah, 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 blah. And then they instantaneously show just how ineffective they are at both diplomacy and leadership by getting taken out instantaneously. It's like, you have six guys. If if I land my ship on, on a planet, and as soon as I step into the town, I look up and I see, like, seven snipers. And the people look destitute. Like, their clothes are rotten. They look worked to the bone. And the further I get in, the more and more soldiers they are. And the person I'm talking to, I'm expecting this person to basically give up their power. It's not going to happen. There's like a level of unrealistic bullshit in the minds of the New Republic in regards to some of these hardcore uh, 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 empire-aligned individuals that they're now attempting to talk down that's just completely unrealistic to me. This is the point in time where I would literally call in the Republic Super Commandos. Like, where is Gina Carano's character in this situation? Call him in. I would have had Super Commandos dropping in like Havoc Squad on this planet. But for whatever reason, she attempts diplomacy, and the diplomacy spectacularly fails. Which, within the first five minutes, I could tell the diplomacy was going to fail. I have no idea how her optimism just just lowered her, her, her ability to realize that this was an absolutely horrible fucking idea. But episode three, not a big fan. Didn't really care for it. Uh, now, episode four, we got into some we, we got into some interesting stuff in regards to Barris. Now, a lot of people, me included, have wondered where exactly has Barris Offy been since the end of Clone Wars. And it's really great to see that essentially they put her ass to work. Literally five minutes after Anakin takes out the Jedi Temple, there's somebody in her room like, hey, look, the Jedi's over with. You can either join up with us, and then the clone troopers raise up the guns, or we can light your ass up inside this 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 prison cell. What you want to do? And Barris is like, hey, look, <laughs> I might be in here, but I will, I'm not stupid. Go ahead and show me what y'all got. Um, it's great seeing the early instances of the Inquisitors, which goes to show that the Inquisitors were always like this shadowy thing in the background, right underneath the Jedi's nose. Because essentially, the Grand Inquisitor exists. Like, f the, the, the second the Jedi Temple falls, he's already over here picking up recruits here and there to see who's going to work out and who's going to fit into his new organization the best. Which means that Palpatine had the Grand Inquisitor essentially working in the backgrounds, in the shadows, the entire time, doing his thing, while the Jedi were just absolutely oblivious to the fact that he existed. That's great. Seeing the initiation in regards to the Inquisitors themselves is always interesting because we know that this early on, Vader has encountered another group of Inquisitors in the Vader comic books, and he goes lightsaber to limbs on them to teach them loss. Whereas with this group, it's a different approach. So I'm wondering whether or not this initial batch was like test phase one 
and then the Inquisitors that Vader encountered on, later on that we'll see encounter, like, Cal Kestis and Ahsoka and a bunch of, like, you know, the second brother and the fourth sister and yada, 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 that they were the, the batch that came after this one. Like, these guys were the test. These four. Four? Four were the original tests. And can I just say, the Inquisitors, at least these Inquisitors themselves... They are legitimately 90% drip, 10% skill, with the exception of Barris. Because all of them look absolutely fa fantastic. You had uh, my boy Maroc, Malak, Ma something, and the Inquisitor that Ahsoka killed in Tales of the Jedi on the farm. He has the best Inquisitor design ever. If we were to ever get future versions of the Sith, or future versions of Sith foot soldiers in either the Old Republic, we're not going to get it in High Republic, either the Old Republic or a Dark Side user post uh, Skywalker Saga. I'm really hoping that that's their design. The design of the Inquisitors in this is fantastic. But but let, 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 let me take a second here. <laughs> Let's take a second here and acknowledge my boy Darth Vader. Walks in, says nothing, turns around, Flashes the Gucci belt, sits down. The goat. <laughs> the goat. The absolute goat. Says nothing. Let's his presence speak for him. Walks in, turns around, flashes the Gucci belt. I'm the one in charge. Yes, I am. Sits down. Didn't even... It, he was only on the screen for five seconds. Like, really, we... I walked... We're going to talk about that towards the end. Because I walked into this thinking that we were going to get a whole lot of Vader. Or at least an episode of Vader. It was an episode of Vader. It's five seconds of Vader. And I'm happy for any seconds of Vader. Because he's one of my favorite, like, top five villains of all time. Um, episode five and six, I feel as though we can just scrunch together. Since it's more or less like part one and part two of a story. Uh, watching Barris go off on missions with the Inquisitor. Where she's all for and okay with killing Jedi. But then once she realizes that the, the other Inquisitor chick is basically killing uh, uh, civilians as well, she's like, yeah, no, I didn't sign up for this. Killing Jedi? Sure, I'll do that. But going out of my way and killing, you know, harmless citizens that are just trying to survive because they're terrified of us and then they also don't want to give up the Jedi, that's not, that's not my nindo. That's not my ninja way. And it was great seeing both, both of them just go their separate paths because I knew, like, when she got force pushed off the cliff, I was like, yeah, no, you're going to be back. Like, th there's no way that dies. I'm, I'm one of those practitioners that I believe that if I don't see a body, you're still alive. Um, where did that Jedi go that Bear saved? Who knows? Thought, it was, thought she was going to come back. She absolutely didn't. Going into number six, it was interesting to see that Barris basically ended up in the same situation as essentially Obi-Wan, where she's just off somewhere. She's a hermit. And she's this wise woman that heals people. I do have a question whether or not Barris actually has or was using the Jedi heal technique or force heal. Because she's ba they basically like, you know, she's, she's a wise woman and, you know, she's been up here. And she's a mystic woman and she heals people. And it was interesting seeing that when she saw the kid, she instantly knew what was up. She was like, yeah, no. The Jedi back in the day, they used to come and claim kids who had high midichlorian counts. That's how I was taken away from my family. It looks as though the Empire is doing the same thing. She's able to put two and two together. And then, of course, as on cue, the person that you think is dead is not dead and then arrives. So you and them can have, like, your final duel and your final fight. Um, this is another episode I did not like. Uh, I was enjoying the episode up until the point where they, she sent her into the cave. And then I thought there was going to be a lesson in the cave. And then Barris gets hit with a lightsaber. And I'm like, well, that's it? Like, is that the beginning and the end of the story of Barris? Where she's just like, you know, I got to get you up out of here. And she picks her up and she carries her out of the cave. I'm like, is Barris dead? Is Barris alive? Did you give us an answer? You fucking didn't. Um, it's a mixed bag. I liked, as I said earlier, certain aspects of this series but i think tales of the jedi told a better story in regards to its title it was tales of the jedi 
Tales of Dooku, Tales of Mace Windu, Tales of Qui-Gon Jinn, Tales of Yaddle, of all of these Jedi's stories that ended up forming this cohesive narrative around Count Dooku, where everything that was basically going on was essentially Count Dooku's journey that leads him to end up to become Darth Tyrannus. I don't think Tales of the Empire does the same thing well. Uh, I really feel as though we didn't spend any time with the Empire outside of the second episode with uh, Morgan Elsbeth, where she's in an Imperial meeting, or the five or six seconds you spend with Vader. There isn't a cohesive story being told in regards to the Empire. If if the cohesive story that Tales of the Empire was basically trying to tell was uh, Morgan Elsbeth losing her village, Morgan Elsbeth going to the Empire and meeting Thrawn, her and Thrawn working together to create this thing, um, Thrawn dealing with the, the Inquisitor organization, the funding going towards the Death Star, and a bunch of other stuff happening on the side, him finally gaining Morgan Elsbeth over to his side by showing her his vision for what he wants the universe to be, her losing Thrawn towards the end of that, but then at the end of the episode, probably like a few months later, having him contact her in some way, shape, or form with the Night Sisters in the other galaxy using Thrawn as a conduit because he was in contact with Morgan Elsbeth. And Morgan Elsbeth basically appraising him of everything that happened with the Empire. And Thrawn telling her, don't worry. I don't know how long my exile is going to be or exactly how long it's going to take you to like finish your machine. But I have faith that you're going to be able to come and get me. That's a better cohesive story about Tales of the Empire. Because then you have a, a straightforward narrative of Thrawn doing his thing and him going throughout the Empire. But then his critique on certain aspects of the Empire. His critique about the fact that the Inquisitors aren't really efficient because they're not being fully trained to be Jedi hunters. His critique about them spending too much money on the Death Star or spending too much, or deciding to move away from uh, clone troopers to actual troopers and how the quality has come down. It, it was really an opportunity to get inside Thrawn's head, especially since Thrawn is just like this super pro imperial dude. And he's basically your big bad going into like your your the movies or the series that you're essentially trying to create. This was a nice chance to get the audience basically acclimated to Thrawn, not only who he was, but who he is and the person that he's going to end up being in the future projects, but also getting them essentially acclimated to his state of mind. The same way you did for Count Dooku, where before you knew Dooku was this bad guy and he had this complicated history with Qui-Gon Jinn, but then once you watch Tales of the Jedi, everything fell into retrospect as to why Dooku fell and 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 why he ended up essentially, you know, becoming the villain. But, uh, like I said, I think 30% of this is really good, but... This one was a miss, and it was and it, and it it was only a miss because I don't think they focused on the right things that they should have essentially focused on. But let me know what you guys think. Uh, comment down below. Let me know what you think about Tales of the Empire, and I will catch you in the next one. Peace.